Good evening and welcome to the Planning Commission meeting of March 12, 2012. Will you please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. We are going to change the order of the agenda um, and before the roll call. We're going to have uh, the Deputy Director, Mr. Mark Town, wants to make some statements. Mr. Town? Thank you, Madam Chair. As uh, many of you are aware, uh, Planning Commissioner Vice Chair Joel Price was selected last Tuesday to complete Dennis Gillette's uh, term on the City Council. Uh, and subsequent to that action, uh, Vice Chair Price submitted his resignation from the Planning Commission and therefore he will not be participating in tonight's meeting. Uh, Mr. Price, however, did agree to come back at our next Planning Commission meeting on March 26th so that we could thank him for his service on the Commission the same evening that we are going to do the same for Barry Fisher. So I just wanted to make that announcement so you understand why you see three Commissioners in front of you this evening. Um, also, I did want to mention that we have two supplemental packets that uh, were provided to the Commission. Uh, both were sent out this afternoon with regard to Case 6B, that is the T-Mobile uh, wireless application. And that's all I had, thank you. Thank you, and would the uh, clerk please call the roll? Commissioner Ferris? Here. Commissioner Turpel? Here. Chair Reynolds? Here. Thank you. And now it's a time for public comments. Uh, if you'd like to speak on something that is not on the agenda, please fill out a white card and submit it to the secretary. I have one card tonight and it's Mr. Jim Bruno. If you come forward, state your name and city of residence and you have uh, five minutes. Good evening, my name is Jim Bruno and I live in the city of Thousand Oaks. Um, I can hear the silence here because you guys are wondering, what's that guy doing up here? Actually, I came down to uh, address the chair tonight. Um, Darla and I found ourselves last week um, before the council, and um, I know, Darla, things didn't work out quite as well as uh, you had hoped that evening, but I just want to tell you as a member of the community how much I respect and appreciate your uh, availability and opening yourself up. It's not all that comfortable to come down and be sort of interrogated, you know, uh, go through an inquisition process when you're just uh, making yourself available to serve. And you did that. And um, I was really touched by a little discussion that you and I had afterwards. Uh, and I wanted to give you this, um, this little plaque. And it's, um, it's actually a little ditty that uh, Mother Teresa wrote. And uh, it reads, people are often unreasonable and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you are kind, people may accuse you of ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you are honest, people may cheat you. Be honest anyway. If you find happiness, people may be jealous. Be happy anyway. The good you do today may be forgotten tomorrow. Do good anyway. Give the world the best you have, and it may never be enough. Give your best anyway. For you see, in the end, it is between you and God. It, is, uh, it never was between you and them anyway. So once again, I just wanted to present that to you, Darl, and compliment you on the human being that you are. And do it anyway. Thank you, Thank you so I, much, Mr. Can I Bruno. The, give it to the staff. Mr. Bruno, please don't leave yet. I just want to thank you. That was really nice of you to do that when you were one of the applicants, too. And Jim and I have known each other since about 1990 when our sons played on the Westlake High School football uh, team together. And I've always respected you, and uh, it's hard when you're going for a position and 
you're running against your friends. And I appreciate that very much, Jim. Thank you so much. My goodness. <laughs> and with that, um, I will have the clerk open uh, case 6A. Hearing advertised as required by law is hereby open to consider agenda item 6A regarding case SUP 2011-70564, applicant Metro PCS California LLC, request to allow the installation of a wireless communications facility on a transmission tower and associated equipment within SCE property. Location 1614, Corte de Acero. Thank you. And Mr. Will Chua, would you like to give the staff report? Yes, good evening, Matt. Um, good evening. Chair Reynolds, members of the commission, for your consideration tonight is an application for a wireless facility to be installed on an existing uh, Edison Tower. As you can see on the aerial, that's the, uh, the uh, location of the tower. This is another uh, aerial view of the uh, site. The site is owned by the uh, Southern California Edison and it's zoned PL. We, uh, our resolution 97197, which is, which is our wireless uh, guidelines for uh, st standards and guidelines for wireless facilities, allows um, allows uh, wireless facilities in a PL zone with a special use permit. This facility, according to the applicant, will provide network coverage in the vicinity of the 23 freeway and Sunset Hills Boulevard. The uh, tower is 80 feet high and there are two other existing wireless facilities on the same property. There will be six antennas installed uh, at the tip height of 56 feet. The uh, equipment cabinet will be installed underground using a power wave unit and there will be an above ground AC unit. This is a picture of the site. The uh, tower on the left, on the right side is T-Mobile. The um, empty tower next will be the uh, future location if approved for Metro PCS. This is a picture. Um, you can, the cursor points to the location of the cabinet of uh, T-Mobile. The uh, cabinet, f the uh, underground vault for Metro PCS will be placed right behind it. As uh, mentioned earlier, 197 requires uh, installation of uh, antennas in a PL zone in an existing structure. Um, the applicant considered three other sites. Uh, one of them would be the um, Sunset Hills Country Club. The other one would be the uh, church on Herbs Road. And the other one would be the intersection, the northwest intersection of uh, Herbs and Sunset Hills Boulevard. The uh, project complies with the FCC's radio frequency standards, and that would uh, that part of the presentation will be uh, given by Mr. Jonathan Kramer. Apl uh, the uh, project, as it is, will have minimal visual impact to the surrounding properties. <coughs> this is a picture looking from Calle de Oro. The, uh, propose, this is a uh, photo simulation of the proposed antenna. This is looking southeast from Corte Cancion. The uh, antenna, the existing antenna for T-Mobile would be the one to the right or to the left. This is another site from Corte de los Reyes. And this is looking from Clarendon Place. place. This shows the location of the proposed AC units and the approximate location of the underground vault. This project is uh, exempt from CEQA under Category 1 exemption since it is a minor improvement to an existing structure. Staff is recommending approval of SUP 2011-564. 
And um, here's uh, Jonathan Kramer, the CP Cell RF consultant. Good evening, Chair and Commissioners. Jonathan Kramer. My firm has evaluated the project for compliance with the FCC's rules regarding RF safety. Those rules are at 47 CFR 1.1307. The project as proposed will fully comply with the FCC rules. Therefore, that really is the limit of our investigation as authorized under the uh, Telecom Act of 1996. We've also recommended and as reflected in the condition the elimination of the applicant's proposed microwave dish. The reason behind this is that the city has had a long-standing policy to minimize the number of elements on all visible wireless sites, and throughout that corridor, we have not permitted microwave dishes. Um, so we, we're recommending that uh, a telephone, a wireline option be uh, uh, required instead of their proposed microwave. Um, with that, I'm available for questions. Thank you. Are there questions of staff? Mr. Ferris? Yes, you mentioned that this com it complies with the F FCC's um, uh, the amount of power that it can it can emit. Is that correct? Or whatever whatever the safety guidelines are. That's correct. Right. The FCC's guidelines evaluate exposure to members of what's called the general population. And those are, for this particular site, those people who would be at ground level. Okay. Does the fact, the fact that there are other antennas very, very close to it, do, does the addition of this combined with uh, the power emitted from the neighboring one exceed the threshold by the FEC, or is that still within the standards? We took that into consideration in evaluating compliance, and the site's summing and, and taking basically the worst case scenario, which is that the antennas would be pointing at the same location, mm -hmm. still fully comply with the FCC rules for members of the general population. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, I did have one question, uh, and I'm not sure who, who to, to, to best uh, um, ask this of. It deals with the compliance with the ordinance um, 97-197, is that it? Um, and this is the alternative site analysis. Um, in general, I know the applicant comes in with a, beer, a preferred uh, site location and they're asked to go and look at alternative sites and they're ruled out for a variety of reasons. Some of them the leaseholder won't let them do it, some of the city's not supporting it, others the RF uh, isn't as, as good. And I know the two of the three sites it was stated that the RF levels were not sufficient to meet the goals of the, of the project. Um, by, by what amount can, can you give me a, an understanding of that? I, I can't give you a quantified number. We evaluated the alternative sites as well. And given where they're trying to cover, um, every site that a, a wireless carrier puts in is a series of compromises. So to, to quantify how, how much is compromised here versus another site, I, I can't tell you. We looked at this site and the alternatives in, lieu, in terms of what has gone before in the city and what has generally been accepted. And, and based on that, we think that this is the best alternative. Okay. Um, in, in reading uh, section N of the ordinance, and which really kind of talks about the, the alternatives, it says an analysis shall be prepared by the applicant which identifies a reasonable number if any exists of the alternative locations and or co-location facilities which are available for such use. And then the, the part I want a little bit clarified is and would provide a reasonably equivalent level of proposed communication services. And it, it doesn't seem to me that these really provide an alternative that we could then judge to say, well, it's pretty clear the one that's being proposed is the best alternative. Um, can you help me with, with understanding that, that interpretation? Well, Resolution 97-197, which has been around for a long time, has given us good guidance over the years in terms of looking at alternatives. And really the number of alternatives that, that we will typically look at uh, will be, n number one, based on the location of the proposed site and its likelihood of being an appropriate location under our past uh, siting processes. So the, the relatively few number of alternatives proposed by Metro is not a surprise um, given this particular, this location. 
It's always possible to find other locations that singly or in concert will provide some level of coverage. But looking at where their target was, this was, the, this was clearly from an RF engineering standpoint the best solution that provided the most coverage from a single site. So while I neither favor nor oppose wireless sites um, on, on policy issues, I look at it from, from an RF engineer standpoint. Mm -hmm. What's going to give the, the most coverage from the least intrusive site? Uh, and, and that's when we start factoring in things like this is existing verticality. It's in a corridor where, where there are other wireless sites in the same corridor. Um, so it's, it's not a, a new, a stark new use along this particular corridor. So the, it is an art as much as it is a science. The science is looking at the coverage. The art is then taking it and looking at the alternatives to say which one makes the most sense given what we know about Thousand Oaks. Okay. Thank you. That was helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Kramer. And with that, I'll open the public hearing. And the first speaker and the main speaker is Alexander Liu. If you'd come forward, state your name, city residence, and you have 15 minutes. Yes, uh, good, good evening, uh, Madam Chair, members of the Planning Commission, uh, staff. Um, thanks very much for this opportunity. I'm Alexander Liu. Uh, I'm resident of Brea, uh, work with Core Development Services at 2903 Suite H, Saturn Street in Brea, California. Um, I'm representing Metro PCS. Uh, what you have before you today is, um, as, as uh, Mr. Shua had, had described, it's a wireless site. Um, in an SE corridor on an SE transmission tower uh, located in an area where there are existing wireless facilities. Um, we were very uh, attuned to the neighbor's request to, uh, um, to underground our equipment enclosure. Um, I know there were comments about the existing T-Mobile uh, equipment enclosure that was um, that's seen as an eyesore by the immediately adjacent uh, neighbor and we took that into account and we, um, we undergrounded our, uh, our, ut our equipment um, for that. Um, that said, uh, the uh, the design is is consistent with what's um, with what with what's sorry <laughs> with what is out there already. Um, it's consistent with the uh, uh, the policy uh, for Thousand Oaks. And um, with that, um, I'm available for any questions and, that you might have. Thank you. Are there questions of the speaker? No. Okay. Thank you. And you'll Thanks have the right much. to rebuttal. Great. Thank you, you very much. And the next speaker is uh, Joy Haley. If you'd come forward, state your name and city of residence, and you have five minutes. Good evening. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Joy Haley. I'm Francis and Richards Alexander's daughter, the owner of the property, uh, which is um, that they needed our permission for the easement access. Um, we do have two other um, sites up on the hill, um, which one of them is an eyesore. And uh, T-Mobile had um, no respect whatsoever um, putting that site there, they didn't try to bury it. They didn't try to put a roof on it. So not only from the property at the lower level, standing in the house or in the backyard, but from inside the house or on the deck, you can see their equipment inside with no roof at all whatsoever. So Metro PC um, has, in my opinion, gone over and beyond our expectations to put this um, site underground so that it would not um, uh, disturb our beautiful view. And um, with that said, um, in our opinion, no, I mean, we really would prefer not to have it like in a hole, but um, uh, we are, we are um, for it in the sense that um, they keep their word as to keeping the vault underground and so that our neighbors or ourselves are not affected by a sightly, unsightly site, as well as taking any money or any uh, value from our property, appraisal value, you know, 
which was a big concern of ours, our view for number one, because it's a million dollar view. And uh, also, um, if it would take any value from our property, that was our biggest concerns. Those two concerns. Thank you. Um, Ms. Haley, would you come back to the microphone? Commissioner Ferris has a question. Thank you. Um, are, are you familiar at all? Did you get a chance to see any of the conditions that Metro PCS are required to comply with as, as part of the permit? Um, the undergrounding and, and keeping it in good condition and things like that. I just want to, so you know, there are conditions they have to abide by. And so I just wanted to know, you know, if you're, you're able to, I mean, if you're supportive of it and supportive of what the conditions, those would be, you know, you'd basically be the vanguard to make sure that they're complying with those things. Um, I believe in, we did hire an attorney to, um, to uh, we kind of went back and forth with um, uh, verbiage on the agreement. And uh, it says, you know, in there that um, you know, the, the, the technicians will have to come now and then. We've already had, we already have two sites there. They don't, they're not in and out all the time. They're, it's not really a bother. That's, it's not that big of a deal. They do let us know when they're coming. Um, as far as uh, my concern was is not only from a ground level, but when I'm up on the deck, I don't want to see any, um, like this thing is going to be a vault. And my question was, um, is there going to be some kind of fencing around it that says warning? Is there going to be any uh, concrete slabs? Is there, you know, that I'm going to see from the, the, the deck or from the, you know, and they said no. Now, um, I'm hoping, I'm, you know, that they're, they're being honest about that because the only thing they're telling me that we're going to see is a air conditioning unit that keeps the, the uh, equipment cool. And that's it. And then what's on the, uh, what's going to be obviously up on the towers. Okay. And so in, in general, you're in, in general agreement with what they have planned for this particular site then? It, because of the fact that they are going to underground it, yes. Okay. If they were not going to even underground it, absolutely not. Because of where it's at, it's like here's my mom and dad's house here. And the view literally goes like this. The one TMO put put right here didn't even try to bury it. So, you know, you, you see a... a uh, eight foot building on the side of their house with you know you don't see through a wall this one is going to be here so the view would be obstructed completely but since they're going to go all the way down we're going to still be able to see okay. out so, Great. and then from the deck where I guess we're only going to be seeing an air conditioning unit which to me for everything they're doing doesn't seem like a whole lot of uh, you know, no big deal okay. Th thank you very much for answering that thank you Ms. Hayden <clears throat> And that's all the cards I have. Let's go back to staff if there's anything else that you'd like to add. Mr. Kramer. Good evening again. Commissioner Ferris, uh, for uh, Ms. Haley, we do have a condition, condition 15, that requires a small sign. That sign is, uh, would be on the, basically the lowest portion of the SCT, uh, SCT, SCE transmission tower. That's the only signage that we're requiring, and that's signage that comes out of the FCC rules. So while there won't be any significant signs or anything like that, just to be clear and make sure that she's aware of it, there will be, uh, there's condition 15 is included that does require this one sign. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Mr. Ferris. All right, thank you. So based on Ms. Haley's comments, um, do you believe that the conditions that you have for the permit address them sufficiently? And so if, she, in her opinion, that, you know, they kind of go, if they go down the road, if something happens, she has recourse to be able to come back to the city and look at the conditions? Um, if I may just point out, um, Ms. Haley's concern is about uh, her seeing a, um, the, the equipment because what happens is that they have a low wall on the side of the property and if you put a standard six foot high wall enclosure for the equipment that will impede her view and um, when, when Metro PCS approach her 
or they have into agreement that the the wall i mean the the vault would be undergrounded and that the only thing that will be visible from her property would be the ac unit and also condition number either 9 or 10 requires that as part of our policy our um, guideline standard guidelines for development we require an equipment enclosure for that property and also to protect Miss Haley's, uh, oh, that's condition nine, uh, to protect uh, Miss Haley's uh, uh, welfare, we require that Metro PCS install some soundproofing or by vi vibration uh, absorbing um, measures so that, you know, there will be less disturbance to Miss Haley or whoever is occupying the property next door. So, but ba I mean, I think you've answered it. I just want to make sure that she and, and others understand. There are conditions in the permit that t uh, attempt to address what Ms. Haley is bringing for this concerns. Uh, and if for some reason down the road, PC Metro PCS doesn't abide by what the promise was, those conditions are there and she has recourse to come back to the city to help make sure they're enforced, correct? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. Mr. Town? Just to follow up on Commissioner Ferris's comments and, and Mr. Chu's as well, these concerns that are raised by by um, the speaker are addressed both in the conditions of approval and also in the plans that you are considering tonight. The plans show an underground vault. They show the above ground AC unit. And so if the commission approves this, those plans are the blueprints for this project and they cannot be uh, changed without coming back to the city for approval. Thank you. Commissioner Turpel? Yes, uh, Mr. Chu, if you could answer, I was looking at condition nine and reading about the, uh, the uh, sound and the vibration because I'm a little bit concerned with the air conditioning unit being above ground and as close as it is to the house. I know that there is a mitigation in there that they have to come back to the community development department to uh, have that reviewed and approved. But what if Ms. Haley comes back and says it's still too loud? Is there a way to handle that? Or? We're going to, um, what we do is we contact the applicant and inform them that, you know, we require additional uh, noise and vibration reduction, whatever is necessary. A little bit additional information is that by having the, the small enclosure around the air conditioning unit, it also shunts the noise upwards rather than horizontally. So it's actually a benefit to having that small enclosure around it just for the purpose that you've, you've raised or the concern that you've raised. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions of staff? Okay, with that, I'll call the applicant back up for rebuttal. You have five minutes, and once again, if you state your name and city residence. Thank you very much. Alexander Liu again of Brea, uh, representing Metro PCS. Um, there's really, we're, we're in agreement with the conditions. We're fine with those. Um, uh, as I as I've mentioned before, we've we've worked very closely with with the neighbors um, and with staff on on the design, and, and the uh, um, we're open to the mitigation measures for the sound um, and the vibration. So nothing really to add, no no real rebuttal or anything. But and all in all, it's been a good experience. Thank you. Any questions, the applicant? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. And with that, I'll close the public hearing. If there are no other questions, and now is the time for deliberation or a motion. Commissioner. Uh, I'm actually uh, uh, impressed with how the applicant has worked with the, uh, the uh, not only staff, but as well as the, you know, the local homeowners. It's really nice to see the operation come in that way. I really appreciate Commissioner Ferris's comments. Um, but I would like to go ahead and move to follow staff recommendation for the special use permit 2011-70564 to be approved subject to all the attached suggested conditions of approval and based on the findings contained in our packet. Thank you. Mr. Ferris, do you have any comments to the motion? O only that, uh, that we didn't have any ad adjusted findings or conditions based on our discussions, right? They're everything that's in the packet. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm in favor of the proposal. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm satisfied that uh, it's met the intent and, and specifics of the ordinance and, and that they've put the conditions uh, to meet with residents' concerns. So for that reason, I'll, I'll support. And I also will support the motion. Uh, I'm very glad that the uh, applicant worked with the property owner, and I thank you, Ms. Haley, for coming down to the hearing and express your views. Uh, it's too bad that your family did have to hire an attorney for the wording, but uh, we appreciate your concern, and we know that you will keep a watch on this.
and make sure the conditions are followed. So with that, any other comments, Mr. Trapel? Then would you please vote? Motion passed, 3-0. And there is a 10-day right of appeal for this project. And we'll go on to item 6B. If the clerk would open the hearing, please. Hearing advertised as required by law is hereby open to consider agenda item 6B regarding case SUP 2011-70525, applicant T-Mobile West Corporation, request to allow the installation of a wireless communications facility on a light pole and associated equipment at Dos Vientos Playfield, location 402 Calle del Prado. Thank you, and once again, Mr. Chua, would you like to give the staff report? Yes, uh, and again. Uh... Okay, that's better. Yeah. Thank you. Again, um, another um, wireless site. This time, it's gonna be at the uh, Dos Vientos Playfield located at the corner of Villa Rio and Calle del Prado. This is uh, the, loca the approximate location of the proposed uh, antennas. As a matter of background, the uh, Dos Vientos uh, Playfield was approved in 2009. It's basically tennis courts, basketball courts, soccer field, um, the PL standards apply in this particular area as imposed by the uh, specific plan eight and nine. Uh, as mentioned earlier, specific um, in the PL zone, a special use com permit is required for uh, wireless communications facilities. There are in the uh, at the um, Dos Vientos Community Park, which is on Borchard Road. There are uh, existing cell sites, there are three of them right now. Um, along with the approval of the uh, play field in, in, in uh, 2000, um, uh, along with the approval of the play field are uh, 22 play field light poles. The light poles vary in height, uh, six of them are 40 feet, 10 of them are 60 feet high, five are 70 feet, and one is 80 feet. The uh, park is currently under construction. The uh, purpose of the site is to provide a wireless uh, connection or wireless coverage to the uh, Dos, Comu Dos Vientos community. This is a view from Calle del Prado looking north of the uh, park under construction. This is at the west end of the park. Um, as you can see, my cursor there around the area where the cursor is, is where the, um, the uh, light will be. <clears throat> and again, the uh, approximate pole location, which is right here. And another view looking east. This is the uh, showing the knoll at the west, at the south end of the park. <clears throat> the, uh, the play field is just next to the, uh, on the left side. The, um, the proposed antennas will be installed on a replacement light standard. The uh, approved light standard is uh, 16 inch at the base and about 12, and 12 inches at the, uh, at the, at the top. The replacement antenna would be approximately 24 inches at the top and 15 inches, I mean, I'm sorry, 24 inches at the base and 15 inches at the top. Uh, the three antennas to be installed will be installed at the tip height, meaning the, the top of the antennas would be at 53 feet high and the pole is, about, is uh, 60 feet. The equipment cabinets will be installed in an underground vault with above ground vents that will appear as bollards. You'll see a picture of those bollards in a minute here. Resolution 97197 
requires that antenna installation on the PL zone be on existing structure. The uh, distance of the proposed antennas to the, re uh, to the nearest residential property is similar to that of what was approved at the uh, Dos Vientos Community Park. Staff has deemed that the uh, antennas as installed will have minimal visual impact among with 22 other uh, light poles out there uh, when the park is uh, fully built. This is a uh, photo simulation of the uh, antennas installed on the uh, pole. This is a view from Calle del Prado, looking north. And this is a view from the north of the uh, uh, north portion of the park on the residential area. This is the above ground vents that were approved on at the uh, Dos Vientos Community Park. This is, uh, these bollards are actually lighted inside to guide uh, vehicles at night. The applicant has considered 17 alternative site analysis. The, um, the particular site was, uh, was selected because of the uh, close proximity to the uh, parking area for equipment access, uh, maintenance equipment access. The uh, actual pole itself, which was approved by the Planning Commission with the field, has been moved approximately 50 feet northwest to, uh, from its original location, the purpose of which is to avoid additional parking light, I mean, uh, I'm sorry, park lights that would be provided for the, uh, for the walkways. This project complies with FCC's uh, standards that, will be as, uh, that would be uh, discussed by uh, Mr. Kramer later. This project is exempt from CEQA, CEQA requirements under, uh, under uh, 15301 because it's a minor, minor improvement on existing structure. Staff is recommending approval of SUP 2011-70525 subject to the conditions and the uh, findings included in the staff report. And here's Mr. Kramer for his presentation. My presentation is very short. We have determined, based on the RF information provided by the applicant, that the project will comply in all respects with the FCC's RF safety rules. So uh, we've given you the recommendation that it is under the FCC rules categorically excluded. We've provided for uh, two small signs, one immediately above and below the antenna, so they're going to be way up in the air. There will be no signage at ground level required for this particular site. That's really my short report on this particular site. Thank you, Mr. Kramer and Mr. Chua. Uh, Mr. Commissioner Ferris? Thank you. Question? Um, so th this is, there are no existing light poles at this point, right? But are there other sites that have been approved for the future light poles at this particular area? Previous, the, in the previous application, there actually was an existing antenna, so I could ask the question of to the cumulative RF effects, but are there any in this one? We have no other pending applications at, at the park. If we do, then we would also do that, that co-location analysis to make the determination as to whether the cumulative effect would be a factor. So there's no pending ones, but have there been others that have been approved for this for the site? No. Okay. All right. Thanks. Commissioner Trapel? Yes, Mr. Kramer, I was looking at the, uh, it mentions there were alternate sites looked at, but uh, it lacked, uh, lacked, that's another new word I made up, uh, inadequate coverage. Do you get, do you actually take a look at, at the other sites and can confirm that indeed they would have inadequate coverage? This project is one that came to the park after another project was turned down by the city. So there's been extensive review about the coverage in the, in the area. Uh, and this is an alternative to another site that was disapproved by the city. So uh, as to 
the the alternatives there, both for this project and for the project that was uh, uh, turned down by the city. I am. In terms of this particular project and looking at it, T-Mobile has set out certain coverage objectives, and from an engineering standpoint, I understand those objectives and why this particular site is the one that is furthest away from from uh, homes and other sensitive uses, uh, and it's also substantially higher up in the air than uh, the alternatives that have been uh, considered. So. I'm, I'm couching my words simply because there are actually two different projects that are in play here. Can you explain that, the two projects? Well, there's the project that was denied by the city, and this, and this is the alternative to it. So this is actually an alternative to a, to a different site. Okay. I got it. Thank you. And I wanted to ask Mr. Chua, the site we're talking about is a church site, correct? And yes, the, it is. Okay, and that backed up really right to neighbors. It was very close to neighbors, the church site. Yes, okay. in comparison to this uh, particular site. Okay, I don't know if these commissioners know where that was. It's off of Raynal Road where... It's uh, at 3947 Kimber Drive. Kimber, it was on Kimber. It was next to the shopping center. They looked, in fact, the alternatives in there talk about the different sites at the shopping center. And I know that uh, we turned it down because it was, we felt too close to the neighbors. I think what, that was one of the findings that the uh, commission found. I'm sorry, Madam Chair, you're talking about the previous project that Mr. Kramer was referring yes, to? Yes, uh -huh, okay. the previous, and, and it was really because it was close to the residents. Uh, Mr. He here? Yes, thank you, Chair Reynolds. Um, Mr. Trapel, and for the audience as well, just as a background, some brief history. Um, you are correct, Mr. Kramer, obviously, um, uh, accurately um, indicated that this was a prior project uh, for this applicant. Um, after the case was denied, the applicant did file a, a suit. The city was involved in that suit. There was litigation to some extent. There is a court order for a settlement. And as part of that settlement, one of the options, again, there's two different sites that we're talking about, but for one of the alternatives for, as part of the settlement is for the applicant to apply for a new location, which is this ballpark. And again, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to ignore any of your rules in reviewing it, but just as a background history, this is now, as part of that settlement, an option for the applicant to come back with a new alternative as a result of that lawsuit and a settlement agreement, one which I'm holding my hand here. And it, again, it just provides that they are going to go forward in good faith, and the city in good faith is going to review their application. Uh, for, and this is the, the ballpark, and this is the one. Hey, thank you for that. Mr. Town? Just a, a point of clarification. Uh, the, the previous site that was uh, ultimately denied was denied by the city council, um, it, but uh, it was approved by the planning commission. And the uh, council denial was as I recall in part due to the uh, architecture of the proposed steeple that was going to be enlarged. Uh, proximity to neighbors I'm sure was discussed there from just in terms of uh, or as a point of reference the proposed site at that Kimber location was about 130 feet from the nearest residential property line. So just wanted to clarify that point. And I know there was a lot of discussion that night about the water tank across the way and all the different buildings at the shopping center that uh, nothing was compatible enough or would give them enough range in that. So, okay, any other questions of staff? Commissioner Turpel? So the recommendation, does this have to be moved up to the council as well as last time or? No, okay. It will only go to council if it's appealed after our, if we vote in support of it, so. That is correct. Or if we vote in non-support, then the applicant might appeal it, so. Okay, any other questions? Then I'll open the public hearing and the applicant. Uh, the speaker is Mr. Walter Gorecki III. If you come forward, state your name and city of residence, and you have 15 minutes. And I do have five cards, so each of the other public will be able to have five minutes to speak. Thank you. Good evening. 
My name is Walter Gorecki. I work for Synergy Development Services, represent the applicant T-Mobile Wireless. Thank you for your time here this evening. I especially like to thank Will Chua for his time in preparation and presentation of the staff report. I think you did an excellent job in describing uh, the need and the purpose and the design of the facility, so I'll, I won't rehash that and um, take up your time with that. You know, the reason why we're here today is we're here to improve telecommunication infrastructure within your city. Improved telecommunication infrastructure is good for the community, it's good for business, it's good for the city. We spent a great deal of time and effort on this project with the design and site location. Careful consideration was given uh, with regards to the city code, T-Mobile's needs, and what the park would allow for their placement. I would like to reemphasize something that Mr. Chua did mention. Dos Fiandos Community Park does have three existing wireless facilities on light poles. The design is, the design is extremely cons, uh, comparable and consistent to what we are proposing to you here today. There was a, a, a concern that I've heard expressed before with regards to the Dos Fiandos Community Park design. One of the poles is extremely large and there's a, like a sheathing that goes around that. Uh, special time and care was taken with designing our pole, which is a round pole. It's not, the, not an 18 uh, edge side pole. And the diameter of the pole is the smallest we can go to to structurally fit the coax within that pole and to uh, make it work for the antenna placement. Our equipment is placed on the ground, so there is visually very minimal impact. This location is an integral part of the T-Mobile network and is needed to fill in a gap of coverage to the surrounding area. The network is carefully designed by RF engineers, taking into consideration other existing facilities and provide continuous coverage from site to site. As was previously mentioned, this is kind of a carryover from a previously existing site. There's kind of, there's a hill range to the east of the park, which kind of separates the original coverage objective, which is right pretty much where the center of where that divide is. So T-Mobile actually had to separate and create two different search rings to satisfy the objective. This is the new search ring that was created to the west of the hillside range to satisfy that objective. And the park was actually looked at as one of the uh, best locations where we could put the facility, and it is the furthest location where we can go from residences. It's also twice the distance from where the, uh, the Kimber Church mention was from residential uh, properties. I believe we're 240 feet away. Um, the Dos Fientos Community Park site, uh, the nearest residence is 260 feet from the nearest pole. So the proximity to residents is very similar. T-Mobile is a registered public utility licensed and regulated by the California Public Utilities Commission and the Federal Communications Commission. As a public utility, T-Mobile is licensed by the FCC to provide wireless communication services throughout California. T-Mobile is dedicated to providing customers with wireless technology designed to enrich their lives and provide more. Efforts are currently underway in the city to establish the required infrastructure. Wireless communications will continue to change the future of telecommunications with easy to use, lightweight, and highly mobile communication devices, including portable telephones, computers, and PDAs. Wireless communications will provide voice, email, internet access capabilities for customers' needs virtually anywhere at any time. This is really becoming extremely much more important in residential areas because we're seeing a trend of people abandoning their landlines for wireless uh, telecommunication devices. Benefits include call privacy and security, improved voice quality, and an expanded menu of affordable products and services for personal and professional communication needs. These wireless networks even feature a locator device that will connect 911 calls to local police and fire departments. In the event of emergency, specially equipped emergency vehicles will be able to identify a customer's location once the call is received. I'm sure you've all heard stories about hikers who have been lost or victims who've been kidnapped or emergencies where uh, emergency service vehicles have been able to locate them by using this type of technology. The proposed facility is to provide an integral link in the T-Mobile pro uh, proposed city network and designed to provide coverage in the immediate surrounding area and to connect to the next site proposed to the east, which is at Newbury Park Plaza. At present, T-Mobile is experiencing coverage problems within the surrounding area. T-Mobile has provided radio frequency propagation maps that show a detailed overview of the proposed facility's range and coverage areas and which justifies the need for the site. You know, this site, the proposed equipment 
operates virtually noise free. There's very minimal sound that comes out of the vent stacks. The equipment doesn't emit fumes, smoke, odor, and they could be considered objectionable. The telecommunications facility is unmanned and only requires periodic maintenance. Typically we tell everybody it's about once a month, but it's more like once a quarter. You know, a lot of technology has developed over the time frame where these devices actually send an alarm back to the home station that tells them that maintenance is needed. So routine maintenance has actually dwindled and it's become uh, less intrusive. I'm here to answer any questions you may have. We're here to ask for your support of our project. We do abide by the city code and I am here to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions of the applicant? I guess not. Thank you. And Thank we'll you. call you back up. <clears throat> and our first speaker is Mr. Tom Hare. If you come forward and state your name and city residence and you have five minutes, Mr. Hare. Uh, <clears throat> my name's Tom Hare, I'm a resident of uh, Thousand Oaks, and I'm representing the Canary Reckon Park District. Uh, thank you very much, Chair and uh, members of the Commission. I'll keep my five minutes to about 30 seconds. I'm just here, as I said, representing the Canary Reckon Park District. Uh, we have been working with the T-Mobile staff for quite a while here in locating this cell site and the location of the cell tower. Uh, we, we, are, we fully support the cell site and the location for several reasons. Uh, one, the site location minimizes the disruption to Canary Work and Park District's maintenance and operations. Uh, two, it increases uh, patron safety by moving it off the, the playing field. And, and three, it mitigates the potential jam damage to the field by moving it uh, a little bit to the south from the original location. And that's all I have to say, but I um, fully support the site location. Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions? No. Thank you, Mr. Hare. The next speaker is Christian Watts, followed by Graham Watts. Christian, if you'd come forward. Oh, Graham Watts. Okay, go ahead. I thought you wanted the other way. Oh. Baby duty. Okay. Good evening. If you state your name and city residence, please, Mr. Watts. Good evening, Madam Chair. Members of the Planning Commission, my name is Graham Watts. I'm a resident of Thousand Oaks at uh, 428 Calle Vera Cruz. We have a home very close in proximity to the park. We're looking forward to the park being developed. We do, however, have concerns regarding the communications facility have from the beginning. I was impressed with the previous um, hearing, having, to, having so much involvement with the applicant and the residents. Uh, I don't know that that's been the case in this situation. We learned of the communications facility with a white um, posting of the board approximately three weeks ago, maybe a month ago. Uh, no information on when the hearing would be held. Eventually it was noted when that hearing would be held and the staff report was made available on Thursday. So we've since reviewed that and have some general concerns that we'll, you'll hear I think repeated from a few other people. Um, the location as stated by the consultant and by Mr. Hare indicates that there's a 250 or 300 foot radius to the nearest residence. Well, that's one of our homes. And as you see, I have a little one, two little ones, and the proximity and the visual blight is not something desirable. It's already been indicated by other real estate agents and experts in the area that these communication facilities do, val do devalue our property. And we have a concern. Once it's in, it's in forever. And uh, while I appreciate the efforts to underground and reduce the plight or the visual impact. I don't think that has been done cooperatively with the, with the neighbors along the street nearest to the park. I'd also uh, disagree with the comment regarding the accessibility of park district equipment to and from the communications facility being accessible. There are several uh, uh, towers and light posts throughout the park and placing the communications facility as close to uh, Calle del Prado as possible is not a good solution. If I could just very quickly, this on the screen, check that. Can't quite do it, I guess. Doesn't project too well, but our park we're looking forward to. The communications facility we are not. We have two little ones, and I don't want to repeat myself, but. 
essentially lack of input and involvement from the residents is a major reason why we're against this project and would like to have been participating in it much earlier than 30 days. I thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Watts. Any questions? Thank you. And uh, Kristen Watts? You come forward and state your name and city residence, please, and you have five minutes. Thank you. My name is Kristen Watts. This is my first planning commission meeting that I've ever been to, but I'm here because I do really strongly believe in opposing the installation of the wireless communication facility at Dos Vientos Playfield. We believe that there are significant health risks of long-term low-frequency electromagnetic fre frequency radiation. We also believe the installation will have an unreasonable detrimental visual impact on our scenic views, which will ne negatively impact our property values. There is current research on the sensitivity of children to electromagnetic fields. We realize that this is a controversial issue. However, there is evidence of an association between childhood leukemia and exposure to low frequency magnetic fields. And concerns about the vulnerability of children to RF waves is being raised because of the greater susceptibility of their developing nervous systems and their brain tissue is more conductive. The RF penetration is greater relative to head size and they will have a longer lifetime of exposure than adults. And this is all being studied currently at the Department of Ephthalmology in LA. And has there been, I ask you, has there been sufficient information to demonstrate that all reasonable alternative sites have been evaluated and required as a city resolution number 97197, such as industrial or commercial areas? as opposed to residential. It is our understanding that the current site proposal is, as a result, it appears of a con uh, current litigation between T-Mobile and the city. Is this proposal or this site just a means to settle this? We also reviewed some of the T-Mobiles with Chrysler King prior location, and pursuant to some of the records, this location was rejected due to hilly terrain, is my understanding. So what has changed? Has the search ring of T-Mobile changed now with this plan? We have lived in Thousand Oaks many years and just purchased this home, our home a year ago. We walked in the front door and walked off the back and decided to buy it based on the scenic views alone. If this wireless communication facility is installed, there will be scenes from our bedrooms, our backyard, and this represents the biggest investment in financial security for our families. We spoke with the local real estate expert in Dos Vientos, who had concluded that property values closer to antennas and cell towers do sell at a less lower rate. Please don't devalue our homes. Also, my understanding of Resolution 97197 is that the standards and guidelines set by the cities for wireless companies should avoid substantially alternate, altering scenic views. An antenna is ugly and intrusive and impacts the aesthetics of our community. How many wireless communication facilities are currently in Dos Vientos? Through antennasearch.com, I searched and currently found 55 towers slash antennas in a mile radius of this exact location. Why do we need another one? Why can't space be shared on an existing location? Is T-Mobile truly lacking coverage in the area? It appears that no matter what phone company you are with, in our, new, in our area in Newberry Park due to the hills, we often lose coverage gaps. I do today. Please list other locations that are being considered. My understanding in research of this as well through the ACORN that there is another a gentleman in North Ranch that spent thousands of dollars for a devaluing of his property based on T-Mobile installing a wireless communication antenna. And after that cost, he actually worked with T-Mobile and they moved it to a different location. We are a family of four, suffering in an economy trying to provide for our family. Um, having thousands of dollars to hire an attorney is not something that we can do. We would like T-Mobile to work with the residents and try to, try, to, try to find a reasonable location for this antenna. This is also in very close proximity to Sycamore School. Listening to you, you talking about the church on Kimber versus this location and 
for one to be denied based on 130 feet, but yet this one to be only 260 feet. It's 130 feet difference. And that, to us, is significant that it's so close. Our understanding with the LAUS uh, school district is that they are not placing these antennas 500 feet from the schools. Why are we placing this so close to our homes? Please tell us what other sections of the play, play field were considered. Are there any other way, areas away from our homes or the schools? Local cities of Agora, Calabasas, and LA are updating their city ordinances to control the growth of wireless communication facilities. What is Thousand Oaks doing? <coughs> Please visualize with me this antenna and only feet away a crib and a baby sleeping and in walking distance our school. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Watt. The next speaker is MQ, followed by Christine Ritzman. MQ, if you'd like to come forward and state your name and city residence, and you have five minutes. My name is Mara Q. I'm a resident. I live on Calle Veracruz, which is within, I believe, 500 feet. I received a letter of this um, city planning meeting. And um, I am opposed to having T-Mobile move a facility within a block of my home, not only for the financial reasons. I am retired. I am disabled. We have other disabled adults who live in our community, as well as very young families. We are, I would say, have the smallest homes on the smallest lots in Dos Vientos Ranch. Um, we have suffered along with all the other reductions in real estate values, and this facility would not improve the quality of life, um, visual aspects, financial aspects. I cannot see one redeeming quality to have this facility put within our neighborhood. Um, we have five towers within our neighborhood right now. T-Mobile already has one or two or three, I'm not sure how many. AT&T, Verizon, Nextel, and Sprint. I looked on the internet and I've done my research. Um, they all have coverage. There's no shortage of coverage in our neighborhood. Um, there are some blank spots, but I would not say any more than any other community. Um, T-Mobile mentioned they already have three existing <coughs> facilities. I overheard the discussion earlier. And so there's really no justification for another. Um, T-Mobile opened their statement this evening saying, the facility is good business. Well, this is a residential community of small family homes, as I said, and we're not interested in a business moving into our community. We want to improve the quality of life for the current residents. We have the park. We have three parks within our neighborhood. We have a middle school and we have an elementary school. And this is where our interests need to focus on. Thank you so much. Thank you. Questions of the speaker? Thank you, Mrs. Q. The next speaker is Christine Ritz. I believe it's Ritzman. If you come forward and state your name as city resident. Thousand Oaks. Would you pull the microphone closer to you? Yeah. My name is Christine Ritzman. I live in Thousand Oaks in Dos Vientos, also on Calle Veracruz. Um, I think my first question has been answered on what is the distance to the homes. Again, I do have to ask what is the, the significant different distance between 130 feet versus 260 feet. I don't see that that is a great improvement and why that makes this so much better um, than the previous one that had been looked at. Secondly, as been noted, there is already T-Mobile coverage within the other Dos Vientos Park. So how much more coverage is this going to lend? I don't really see if it's in the larger Dos Vientos Park and now we're going to have it in this park, why we need two when they're not even a mile away from each other. I, I don't understand what the importance and what is going to be gained by that. Thirdly, as people have already noted, there has been no communication or working with the homeowners. Um, and fourthly, it says that this is to improve upon an existing pole. There is no existing pole in that location. So I have to ask, what are we improving upon? This is a new pole. It's not improving an existing pole. Um, 
And again, how is this really going to affect what we already have in Dos Vientos? I, I see no, no need for this as it is. Thank you. That's Questions of the speaker? Thank you, Mrs. Ritson. And our final speaker is uh, Mr. Chuck Lee. If you come forward and state your name and your city residence, please. Good evening. Uh, hey, good evening. Uh, my name is Chuck Lee. I'm a resident of Thousand Oaks for over 10 years. Uh, thank you uh, for having the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, I live nearby the south side, and my main concern was already uh, brought up by many speakers before me. Uh, but the, the biggest concern I have is the proximity of the south side to, uh, to Sycamore Canyon schools, uh, where so many kids uh, uh, go there every day, especially the kindergarten yard is at the nearest proximity to the south side. And I have sent uh, an email to uh, Dr. Sands in Sigma Canyon, who's the principal of the school, as well as Mr. Chua and Mr. Uh, Town, who are here today. And uh, in the email, I attached some uh, uh, scientific publications that raise concerns about uh, exposures from this uh, electromagnetic radiation from the, from the south side. And I remember men uh, hearing, uh, <clears throat> uh, hearing a few mentions of the FCC uh, regulations and how this design uh, is within the limits of the FCC rules, as well as the Telecommunication Act of 1996. Now, I want to highlight 1996. That is a, the standard based on 1996 technology. And as we all know, technology evolved over years, especially you know, wireless communication technology. Back then, we did not have 3G. We did not have 4G LTE. And who knows what's coming next? The frequency of modulation has changed. Uh, power amplification has changed. So 1996 is an old standard. And we shouldn't be confined to those kind of standards that were set by the government. Uh, the, the federal government back in 1996. We should be forward-looking and future-looking. And in fact, I can cite a few documents or journals, which I can uh, put on the overhead here. Um, this is a publication, if you can see on the overhead there. This is a publication in the Journal of Pediatrics citing uh, the potential harmful effects of uh, wireless uh, sources. And that publication was dated 2004, okay? My next, my next exhibit, it's a recent review uh, site. Uh, the title of this paper is a review paper. It's calling the biological effect from exposure to electromagnetic radiation emitted by cell towers, uh, base stations. Can you hear me? Yeah. So the title of the paper you can see here is the Biological Effects from Exposure to Electromagnetic Radiation Emitted by Cell Tower Base Stations and Other Antenna Arrays. Although the finding of the paper, review paper is inconclusive, there are definitely uh, doubts about the safety and, uh, uh, of, of these kind of installations. So I want to ask the, the city, why do you want to risk the future of our children, the health of our children, and the staff and teachers at Sycamore Canyon uh, to this kind of risk for the conveniences of few people or maybe for just slightly better coverage uh, of uh, um, mobile communication. Um, have you thought about other sites, other better sites that has less harmful effect to our children? As many speakers have already cited, and also the paper, scientific publications, children are the most susceptible to uh, constant or long-term effects of this radiation. We as adults pass by perhaps cell sites many times a day. However, those are incidental exposures, incidental. And they are very limited. So the effect on our health may not be as detrimental as children who are playing in the school grounds every day for most part of their life. And so I really want this commission to consider this carefully. And in fact, as uh, also was cited by previous speakers, Here's a resolution and um, motion 
by the LAUSD, Los Angeles Unified School District, to limit the, the installation uh, distance of the wider cell site. Again, here's another motion. It's all re relating to how our Unified School District is protecting, protecting the students and staff. Why can we not do that in Thousand Oaks? So those are my concerns and my comments, and uh, I'm, av I'm available for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions of the speaker? Thank you. And Mr. Lee, we did receive all of your information earlier this afternoon, and a copy of it was provided to us tonight, so the commissioners you have had a chance to look Thank over. you. Thank you. Along with those speakers' cards, I also had two statement cards, and they are both opposed. Uh, we'll go back to staff at this time. Mr. Kramer or Mr. Chua, if you have additional comments. Yes, uh, Chair Reynolds, I would like to address the, uh, aside from, um, Mr. Kramer here will address the uh, technical issues that was brought up by the, uh, previous, by the speakers. I would like to address some of the uh, comments regarding uh, the notification. Our municipal code requires a 45-day notice to be sent out to the applicants within 500-foot radius of the property, and also a sign has to be posted. Uh, on my record here, the sign was posted on um, January 25, 2012, which is about 45 days, maybe 47 days from today. Um, also, at the time, at same time, a notification was sent out to the uh, property owners within, like I said, the 500 feet radius. Um, as far as cooperation with staff and the neighbors, yes, we do want um, to, uh, to, we do encourage the applicant to work with the uh, property owners within the property. Now, for us to know that we should be given enough time to um, know what the concerns are. Now, I received a few phone calls maybe two or three weeks ago expressing concerns about RF safety, and my normal response to that was that the city is, uh, the city's hands are tied as far as the uh, TCA of 1996. That would be a deal, um, that would be discussed by Mr. Kramer here. However, the uh, formal letters of opposition or emails of opposition that I received, I received them late last week. So that does not give us time to, uh, to see what the concerns are. Now, as far as viewshed is concerned, and um, one, of the, uh, one of the speakers <coughs> mentioned that there is no existing light on the, on the uh, park right now. Yes, it is, but there are approved lights. On the property, there are 22 um, light poles that were that were approved uh, for the property when the property was approved for a uh, park development. Um, so um, let's see. That's that's all I have as far as uh, in response to the uh, comments from the public. And here's Mr. Kramer. Chair and Commissioners, if you'll allow me a couple of minutes to refresh the Commission's recollection regarding what our authority is under the Telecommunications Act in this area, and also to help to explain to the public what, uh, how we have to evaluate projects under federal law. The Telecommunications Act of 1996 determined that the FCC would be the sole national agency to establish RF safety standards. And the reason was that Congress wanted one national standard. They didn't want a patchwork. Thousand Oaks has its standard. Westlake has its standard. Agoura has its standard. So Congress made that decision in 96. The FCC, following on the authority of Congress, did establish those federal standards in conjunction with industry organizations, government agencies. They looked at other standards that were in place, they talked to the military, they went out to private uh, experts, and they came up with a standard. And when you come up with a standard, you know, you have to measure it against something to know what it is that you're protecting the public from. 
So the FCC first determined at what level you could actually measure a biological change. And in this case, the change is a rise in temperature of, of a human cell. We're not talking about a DNA issue, we're talk, or a, a DNA break or anything like that. We're talking about temperature. That, that's the effect at these particular frequencies. So once the FCC established what that standard was, then they had to set their own standard, their maximum, at, at some lower point. And they, frankly, had to figure out how much safety margin they wanted to build in, whether it was two times, ten times, whatever. And the commission settled for a 50, five zero times safety margin. So that the maximum permitted by the FCC is 2% of that point where you can actually measure a temperature change. And the FCC felt that that was an appropriate standard. That standard has been around since 1996. It has not changed. The FCC does review that from time to time to see if there's something that would give them pause for concern. That hasn't occurred at this point. In actual operation, wireless sites emit substantially lower than that maximum level permitted by the FCC for a simple reason, which is that they're not trying to cover large areas. We had a commenter this evening talking about the fact that there's another T-Mobile site a mile away. Because we're dealing with two separate factors, coverage and capacity, coverage is just laying out a signal over an area. Capacity is actually having enough bandwidth within a particular area to serve all of the customers in that area. So the result is that because the carriers have a finite number of frequencies, what they do is they put in additional cell sites and constrict the coverage from each cell so that they can reuse those frequencies, and that's how they address the capacity needs. And for anyone who has any question about capacity, just you know, count the number of wireless devices you have from your cell phone to the cell phone that's built into the car, like the OnStar and things like that. Uh, there are a tremendous number of devices that use wireless technology, and that's placed the capacity demand on the various carriers. A commenter tonight talked about the fact that there's adequate coverage from the other carriers in the area. The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals has given us good guidance on that. It used to be in the Ninth Circuit in this area of, of the western U.S. that if one carrier had coverage in an area, the court said, you know, that's enough. But the reality is, is that the Ninth Circuit gave us in uh, 2004, 2005, a decision that said, no, you can't look at the fact that one carrier has coverage because, as an easy example, if you've got a Metro PCS phone, you can't roam on the T-Mobile system. They are incompatible. So the courts have instructed us to look at the coverage, the, the service that's provided by the applicant before us, and not to consider the others who may be in the area. So someone else could have wall-to-wall -wall coverage, but we're constrained by court rulings to look at the coverage, the, the, the coverage request from the applicant before us. So as we look at these projects, we're only looking at T-Mobile's coverage and what their goals are. And for T-Mobile to have a site a mile away in, in this technology, that's, that's a substantial difference, a substantial distance now. Now, when we're talking about the former T-Mobile site, because commenters made comparisons to that in terms of the distance from the property, to, to recall what the city attorney clarified earlier, the issue wasn't the distance. That was not the issue in that case. The issue in that case was the um, substantial increase in the size of the bell tower at the church. And from an aesthetic issue, the council felt that that was not uh, appropriate at that location. Here we've got a situation where we've got a pole that's going to be there anyway, one of 22, and adding facilities to, to that previously approved pole. So that might help to, to uh, frame that issue. There were several commenters tonight talking about the, U, uh, the uh, LAUSD decision. That decision, the, the, the school district made a, a decision as a property owner, not as a government agency, but as a property owner to say, look, we just don't want to have cell sites on the properties. 
And, and that was their right. There are many school districts that have gone in that direction. There are also many school districts that actively uh, seek out wireless uh, carriers so that they can generate revenues to offset budget cr crunches. But that was a private decision, not a governmental decision. It was a private landlord decision, effectively. Um, so uh, it's important to frame under what authority they were operating. I'm familiar with AntennaSearch.com, and they list all the licensees. In a particular area, they list ham radio operators, they list two-way radio services and so forth, but those are not compatible with, with this search. So the fact that there are a large number of licensees in a particular area is not the relevant factor. It's what are those licensees actually permitted to do? Have they actually built the facilities? Having a license to cover a particular area doesn't mean that there's an actual site in place. So I think I've answered. Mr. Chua will, will finish my presentation. How's that? Well, I would just like to uh, clarify and add something to, the, uh, to, to what was uh, in, uh, in response to uh, what was brought up earlier. Um, one of the speakers mentioned that there are three other, three other carriers at the, uh, three carriers at the uh, Dos Vientos Community Park. Uh, let me just make it clear that T-Mobile does not have a site on that property. Um, the other three carriers, the, uh, the three carriers on that area or that Dos Vientos Community Park would be Sprint, Verizon, and AT&T. Now, as far as addressing the other, lo uh, other poles within the Dos Vientos Park itself or the Dos Vientos Playfield, um, that location was the best location as far as uh, the park district is concerned and Mr. Uh, Tom Hare would be here to explain why that particular site or particular pole was uh, selected. And Be before he comes, he comes up, I, I want to complete one thought regarding RF safety. As I was talking about Congress delegating national authority to the FCC, Congress also in the Telecom Act said essentially if a project is designed to comply with the FCC rules that are in effect, then that is the end of our exploration of that question. It no longer becomes a factor for us to consider. So to wrap this up with a bow, effectively Congress has said, FCC set a national standard. Cities, you can evaluate to determine whether a project will meet the FCC standard, but you can't set your own standard. You can't even adopt the FCC standards as your, as your own. And if the project is designed and shown by engineering data, as has been the case in the, both projects this evening, to be designed to comply with the FCC rules, then that is the end of your exploration. You may not base a denial on, on RF concerns beyond that. And that's why I wanted to add to bring that to, to conclusion. Okay, I'll call Mr. Tom here back up to the podium. Is that all right with the commissioners? Okay. We you state your name and city residence again, Mr. Hare. Wait. No, representing the Canary Reckon Park District. Uh, thanks again, uh, Chair Reynolds and members of the commission. Uh, simply put, we, we did look at, um, and I can't speak for T-Mobile as far as uh, their, uh, their coverages and, and all that. Yeah, that's, that's not something I'm concerned with. Um, it's, I'm, I'm more concerned with location at, at the park facility. Uh, we did consider, uh, in working with T-Mobile, we did consider three different locations on the site where we had discussions. Um, and I don't know if you have it in front of you, and, and I'll try to describe it as best as I can, but we did look at uh, Pole C1, which is in the northwest corner of the property. Um, and, we did, and that was a 60-foot pole that we determined that was, uh, it was close, too close to the, too, it was the closest pole to the school, and it was the closest pole to the playgrounds. And we also looked at, um, I'm trying to remember what it was, I think it was A2, which was in the, which is an 80 foot pole in between the softball field one and softball field two. Um, and that was, that was, that was considered, uh, but as we stated before, due to um, the, the, um, 
uh, due to the location of it being in the middle of a field, it, it does uh, hurt our operations, uh, Canary Reckon Park District's maintenance and operations and uh, turf damage that results from maintenance on the pole. Uh, so we did look at pole, uh, the, the current location, and we determined this was the most desirable location uh, for the Canary Reckon Park District in conjunction with working with T-Mobile. And I'm available for questions. Okay. Thank you. Are there any questions to Mr. Uh, Commissioner Trapel? Good evening, Mr. Hare. When you were talking, when you're taking a look at the other polls that are, you're, talk, you're talking about the proposed polls of the new park that's coming up, correct? Yes. Yeah, they're, so, they're, not, they're, not, they're not there, but they have been approved and, and will, be, will be coming. Okay. And the, can you explain to me a little bit when you're talking about the, the one poll you were talking about dealing with the maintenance? What, you're not talking about T-Mobile coming out to maintain, are you talking about yes. Park District? T-Mobile. T-Mobile's maintenance. Uh, when when T-Mobile, we do have a, a similar situation at, a, at another another park, at a T.O. Community Park, uh, where the pole is located in the middle of the field, mm -hmm. and the damage that it's incurred from you know, traversing the field and going in right into the middle of the field uh, is sometimes can be significant, um, and sometimes it hurts our operations as far as if we've got soccer games scheduled. Uh, softball game scheduled where we have to rearrange our schedules, but we, tr we try to work with the carrier as much as possible But that is something that we did consider uh, in looking into it and in addition to the the pole maintenance um, I remember again. I can't speak too much for T-Mobile, but a lot of it had to do with the location I know there's um, again speak, putting words in their mouth uh, But uh, it has to be the equipment underground equipment involved has to be located relatively close to the pole and the location of that 80-foot pole did not provide a uh, sufficient distance where the underground vault would be in the field rather than off the field where the, the current, the current uh, proposed location is. Yeah, because the only reason I, I bring that up is because the applicant mentioned with the new technology that they're hardly out there maybe only four times a year. Uh, were you guys thinking about that too? Or? Yes, that's mm -hmm. four, four times a year, uh, sometimes too much. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions to Mr. Hare? Thank you, Mr. Sure. Hare. Are there questions? Um, this time we'll go back to the applicant for rebuttal. If you'd like to come forward and state your name and city residence again, Mr. Gorecki. Gorecki. Walter Gorecki, uh, T Mobile West Corporation, applicant representative, residence Tarzana. I'll try and go through all of the concerns that were raised and echo some of the answers that were provided. First of all, as far as an alternate site analysis goes, I mean, I, I'd ask you, what is your typical number of sites, alternate site analysis that you see that are done that come before you? I've done a 17 site alternate site analysis. I have done my homework. I have looked through the area to find out what um, possible placements there are. There aren't any commercial locations or industrial locations where we can go to that we're gonna meet the objective. We are the furthest from residential that we can go and meet the objective. You know, we did look, T-Mobile did look um, at possibly moving to the next pole over to the east um, because it wouldn't be too far in, um, but we do, as uh, Mr. Tom Hare mentioned, we have a constraint with where we can put the equipment. We've got to be 125, 150 feet from the antenna, so you have to actually take into consideration the height of the pole and the placement of the antennas, which is 53 feet, and then your placement of your equipment. So if we move any further out, you're gonna be placing the vault in proximity where you have a highly traveled path, it could create a hazard. And also, if we move uh, further to the east, as Will Chu has shown in this presentation, there's a large hill to the south, which would shadow the signal to the southwest. Proximity to homes, again, we're as far as we can get from uh, proximity to homes. You have three similarly designed sites that have been approved before. So I think it's kind of tough to say that it's a visual light when the planning commission and planning staff have approved multiple times a very similar design at a park that is a little bit away. And as Mr. Wilchua did mention, somebody mentioned that T-Mobile's over at that park. We're not there. The need, again, the site is needed. There's no existing sites that we have in the area that reach coverage into this location to provide the satisfactory coverage that's required. Um, with, uh, with regards to improving the existing pole, as Mr. Wilchua uh, mentioned, we are going on a pole that would have been placed there by the park. 
So we are actually, it would be replacing a pole, you can think of it that way. Um, would you rather have the park go spend the 20 grand to place a pole there and, and then just rip it out and then have T-Mobile place their pole there? So it's just a matter of economics and saving the park district some, district some money. Uh, with regards to property values, um, you know, I'm a real estate agent. The first thing I did when I bought my place was to check to see if I had cell phone coverage. You know, I can't live without it. I can't operate without it. I can't work without it. I'd like to submit to um, the record. This is a report that was done by Tarantello and Associates. They're actually a real estate appraiser. I'm going to refer to page two, paragraph two, and read from that. Although our firm has been involved in the value analysis of numerous wireless antenna installations, we have never found any statistical observable property value impacts through our own research. In a comprehensive statistical study involving installations in the city of Thousand Oaks, we compiled sa sales price data within the same market area where similarly designed wireless insta installations had already taken place. This approach allowed us to draw conclusions on the potential value impact of the proposed site. This particular study detailed single family residential sales data for seven existing wireless antenna locations currently on air and within close proximity to the proposed new antenna site. We compared the rate of change in the median price per square foot of single family homes within one half mile of the antenna to the same index of median price change outside the half mile radius. We included every recorded single family sale beginning one year prior to the date of the installation through the date of our study. Hundreds of sales were used in the analysis lending a high degree of statistical significance to our results. And then I'll read the next sentence for the next paragraph. The finding of the study, the findings of the study were conclusive. Not a single example was found to support the test hypothesis that property values declined after the installation of wireless antenna. Moreover, although the study was not designed to study or suggest the wireless antenna created value to homeowners, we nonetheless found that homes located within proximity to some sites actually experienced somewhat greater price appreciation. I hope that helps address some of the concerns with property value. And with that, your time. I'm here to answer any additional questions. You okay, may have. thank you. Any questions to the applicant? Commissioner Ferris, would you please come back to the podium? Thank you. Sure. Um, and as you mentioned, you said uh, some of the testimony from, from some of the residents had said that there are, there are other T Mobile uh, antennas in, in the area. You had just said that there is none at the current Dos Vientos uh, park location. Is that correct? There are not any T Mobile facilities at the Dos Vientos Community Park, which is the park that we've been referring to that had the three other existing facilities. Right. Nor is there an existing T-Mobile wireless facility that propagates a signal to this area to provide coverage. Okay. Are you able to have a facility uh, at the Dos Vientos Park? We actually have discussed that. The, there's actually a need to have an additional site at that location. So placing a facility at that park would not satisfy this need, but it's actually an additional need, an additional site that is required to cover additional area further to the east. Where are your locations right now then in serving the Dos Vientos area? Uh, the nearest site is um, First Christian Church. Which is to Can you give me an address. I think I might actually. You know, know I think it's 805 or 50 Norwood. Okay. Oh, so you're you're over you're over the hill. Yeah, it's there's there's no sites as I mentioned previously. There's no sites that reach coverage into this area. There there aren't. So since there's no coverage in the area, I mean, wouldn't wouldn't one in in the greater Dos Vientos area be better than? really focusing on this this one? Well, you know? we have to abide by the city code and with what the city allows with the height and the placement of the antennas. And when you site, sell sites, it's not just, I'm gonna place it here, I'm gonna place it there. It is, it is complex. You know, think of it as a sprinkler system in a lawn. It, when you place your sprinklers in a lawn, if you place your, place your sprinklers too close, you get mud. You place it too far away, you've got dead grass. It's kind of a similar situation. And with the coverage objective that we had, and, and the need to satisfy that objective, we are at the location we need to be. How many do you plan 
to put in the Dos Vientos area? Do you have other pending applications that, that are with the city? As I mentioned previously, this ring was split into two locations because of the challenging topography in the area. Uh, there is a proposed site that is in the planning department for the Newberry Park Plaza on the corner of uh, Reno and Kimber. Mm -hmm. And we don't have a site planned there yet, but the radio frequency engineers are looking at Dos Fienos Community Park for a future site placement. I know of no other sites in that immediate area. Okay. Thank that you. are currently being looked at for a proposed future placement. Thank you. Any other questions of the applicant? Then thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, any other questions of staff before I close the public hearing? Oh, Mr. Kramer. Commissioner so, Ferris, go ahead. <laughs> My apologies. Um, Mr. Kramer, uh, so I'm looking at basically attachment 6.02A, which is the uh, current coverage without the proposed site. Um, it, it, and when I look at that and then I compare it with, let me, I'm, I'm stepping through this, so if I, I apologize, uh, 6.04, which is then what the coverage would be with the proposed site, it's very green uh, within the Dos Vientos area. Um, it, would, it would seem to me that there might be other locations within the general Dos Vientos area that may actually provide coverage in a similar way to this specific area that they're looking for, but also Dos Vientos in general. I guess T-Mobile is Am I correct in that? That's my question, I guess. There is always, there is always an alternative. As an RF engineer, it, when, when an applicant comes and says there is one and only one site that will work, the odds of that being true are somewhere around 0.001%. There, there, there's always that possibility. So there are clearly other ways that T-Mobile could do it. Now what it would require would be the addition of, of even more sites. There's a different technology called distributed antenna systems that would require the placement of antennas on top of light standards in front of homes. That would provide a, 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 that could provide an equivalent coverage. The issue why this site has been promoted by staff in, in this application as being a suitable location under uh, 97 197 is that it provides the most amount of coverage in this area without adding new verticality. The verticality that this is going to be attached to is, is going to exist one way or another. So we looked at this as to what was going to have the least additional impact on the community. As Mr. Gorecki was indicating, there's another search ring out for the other end uh, of the community, and that's, as you may remember from earlier in the discussion, because the Kimber Church was, was turned down, T-Mobile is actually looking at two sites now to replace the one site that they believe would have provided adequate coverage in the area. So they've already gone from one to two sites and what, what we would be talking about would be going from two to some additional number of sites. So where, where we're looking at this in terms of the coverage is what's the way to minimize the number of facilities in the city, given the constraint that the city has not approved the church, how do we minimize then these sites and put them in areas where they will have the least impact on the community? So that's why we came up with this. Is there an alternative? There's always an alternative. Is there a better alternative? The alternative to this site would actually be more than one site to, to that end of the community and, and plus an additional site over on uh, near Kimber, well, at the, at the shopping center itself. All right, thank you. Mr. Heher, do you wanted to make a statement? Thank you, Chair. Um, just to add to what Mr. Kramer said and um, before the public hearing closed, I did check the FCC guidelines as uh, late as this afternoon. Uh, we have received a number of um, uh, comments about safety concerns, uh, greater risk for children, the FCC is, has acknowledged those reports. Um, they understand that those assertions are there. Um, but I want to quote what currently the FCC's position is 
and that is, quote, those evaluating the potential risk of using wireless devices agree that more and longer term studies should explore whether there is a basis for RF safety standards than is currently used. The FCC closely monitor, monitors all of these studies results. However, at this time, there is no basis on which to establish a different safety threshold than our current requirements. So you heard the comments regarding the 1996 Act. Um, Mr. Kramer has already acknowledged that um, and responded to that query. I just want to again emphasize that the FCC is acknowledging these reports, but they currently, as of today, have said this is our standard, this is what we must go by. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments before I close? Then I'll close the public hearing. And now is the time for deliberation. Motion. Commissioners? I'm, I'm sorry, the hearing is closed. Commissioner Ferris? Uh, thank you. Um, there certainly are uh, merits to the location. Um, I mean, I, I think the concerns that the residents have brought up regarding home values, um, I think they do have some concerns. Uh, but as the, as the applicant kind of mentioned, there might be some residents that think that that's a benefit of having uh, better cell coverage. So it may wash out. I, I'm, I'm not taking the testimony of the affidavit here. There's just pluses and minuses on doing that. Uh, Mr. Kramer is correct with respect to RF. I do know uh, I've been through a number of these things before, and um, RF is not a consideration that we can, in fact, base a denial on. Um, so... Uh, and with respect to aesthetics, one of the purposes of the resolution is, in fact, to try to blend it in with existing verticality so that we do not end up having additional poles uh, that, that further increase the blight of what's, what's necessary for the technology. Uh, saying all that, um, I do have concerns with the application as it's meeting with what I believe are, are necessary components for uh, the ordinance in this application. And I'm fully understanding that this is a process the applicant is taking with respect to dealing with the settlement of the previous denial. Um, but my hope would be is that, that with these comments and depending on how the commission uh, deals with this, that it can lead to a successful um, application by the applicant, but by dealing with some additional concerns uh, that, that in working with the residents can hopefully resolve. Uh, I do have concerns about the alternative site analysis. While there are a significant number of sites that have been listed, uh, as I look at the map uh, on um, uh, the search ring, there really are only three of the 18 locations that are within a reasonable proximity of this particular area. Many of them are on the other side of the hill um, and um, were identified as not providing RF coverage or the property, with, uh, property owner wasn't uh, conducive to, to leasing it. Um, you know, given that they have no coverage in the area with respect to their T-Mobile sites, I would think that this would uh, be a, an opportunity pr to provide at least one so that they can gauge whether that one can provide coverage and then determine later whether a second one uh, can be done. So the, the search area would seem to me to be, to be, should be wider. There are um, certainly, uh, I think, other alternatives that can meet that. And in doing that, it should be done in concert with the concerns of the residents in the area to, to balance those concerns they have as well as the, the concerns the applicant has with respect to being able to uh, deploy their service in the area. We can't do it based on RF. Cannot, that home values, it's tough to make a case. And aesthetics, I believe they have done what they can do. You try to put it on poles that are existing and not have the big trees of antennas. Uh, but my hope would be is that they can uh, work with residents to meet a, a mutually agreeable area to serve the needs of Dos Fientos community for the T-Mobile customers, but also meet the needs of residents. So I would be uh, not necessarily in favor of, of uh, uh, approving this application at this time, but hopefully to provide some guidance for, uh, for the applicant in working with the residents to, to come up to an agreeable solution. 
Commissioner Turpel. Um, you know, this is what we're here for. It's, a, it's tough when you have um, residents' concerns come up before the commission. And although I'd uh, echo many of the uh, uh, sentiments that Commissioner Ferris had, and I would actually have preferred it if, if T-Mobile had reached out to the local residents a little bit more, uh, I don't know what more they could possibly do in going forward with this. And I don't know by not voting in favor of this tonight, what we're, we're just putting off the inevitable is what I'm thinking about. Um, you know, I spent 20 years in broadcasting and sat down with a lot of uh, people with the background that Mr. Kramer has, and they are weird people that play with RF. They're very strange. They play with antennas and they come together, And um, but he's right. It is a compromise. It's constantly a compromise figuring out um, how to pull these things together. And as uh, the applicant gave a great analogy in dealing with his sprinklers, because that, that's, that's actually what technically happens. And then when you start building arrays and pointing different things, it can get very complicated. Um, so I would actually have to say I'd be in favor of going forward with the project this evening. Do you want to make a statement? Oh, okay. And I feel the same way that Mr. Chappelle does. I've seen many of these. Um, I'm just so glad that our city does not approve trees. When I was on the County Planning Commission, we approved the antennas, they were trees, and they're very obvious, they're phony trees. So the aesthetics, I don't think we're ever good with that. Um, I feel the same way, that I'm very sorry that the residents weren't more involved. And, and I guess I would have to put blame on the Property Owners Association that they were sent notices along with the property, and it's really their duty to contact the neighbors when they get a notice. And. Uh, to take a stand. I know in the past we've had, especially the uh, Westlake North Ranch area is very vocal in coming down and speaking to us about any tower. So it's really too bad that your association has failed you when it probably is a mandatory association. But I think that with the RFs, we've heard it many, many times, and there are no, I think, conclusive studies. And it was an interesting report that Mr. Lee, I. I read through it, and it was interesting about the genetics of the DNA and the different studies that have taken place, but uh, I would have to support this project as, as So would you like a presented. motion? Yes. I go ahead and move that uh, we approve stack, staff's recommendation for special use permit 2011-70525 to be approved, subject to the attached conditions of approval and based on the findings in our packet. And I'd encourage T-Mobile and the Caneo Recreation and Park District to reach out to those residents to see if there's anything uh, with the mitigating, anything you can do to mitigate those concerns. Mr. Ferris, do you want to make a comment to the motion? Yeah, as, as I mentioned, I'll, I'll vote against the motion for the reasons I stated before. I, sometimes mm -hmm. when, when these things come up, sometimes residents may want to appeal or something. I do caution the residents at this point, though, there are a lot of things, as I stated, might be very difficult uh, for grounds of appeal. Can't really do it on RF. You know, and the things that I've told you are concerns I had with how the application meets with the current ordinances. That's all, or the resolution, that's all we really have to base it on. So, um, you know, my, my, my hope is, is that there can be a, a mutual, mutual uh, agreeable solution on this. And uh, for that reason, I give the opportunity to do that by voting against it. Thank you. Uh, would you please vote? Motion passed, two to one, with Commissioner Ferris opposed. And there is a 10-day uh, period of appeal. Thank you. We'll continue on with the agenda. Uh, item number seven, Community Development Department reports and referrals. Mr. Town. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a couple of uh, quick uh, notes. We will have a meeting on March 26th in two weeks, and then another meeting following that on April 9th. And then as far as items that you have recently considered and have been considered subsequently by the City Council, uh, the uh, case involving auto repair and its inclusion in specific plan 15 that you considered on January 23rd uh, was considered by the City Council last week and approved as recommended by the Commission. 
and the case involving the lakes uh, east of Civic Arts Plaza is scheduled for consideration, and that had to do with parking standards. We'll be going before the City Council on April 10th. And that's all I had at this time. Thank you. Thank you. And minutes of the February 13th, 2003rd meeting. Do I have a motion? Mr. Trapel, thank you. Uh, I vote, moved. please. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't need that for the record, did you? Yeah, that well, you are uh, making your move, move to approve. Okay. Motion passed three to zero. <laughs> And are there any AB 1234 reports? Okay, commission comments. Mr. Commissioner Ferris. Um, it is too bad we can't uh, thank former Commissioner Price for serving with him, but I guess we'll get the opportunity at the next meeting to do so. Uh, uh, these, these chairs, they're... They're getting kind of vacant here, and so you know, hopefully, we'll get uh, a new batch of, of public servants soon. And and uh, um, uh, wish wish uh, future council member Price well on on the council and uh, guiding city policy. Thank you, Mr. Chappell. Yeah, I want to echo uh, Commissioner Ferris's statements, and uh, as well as just please don't call in sick anybody. <laughs> And I have to agree with my fellow commissioners. Uh, it was a pleasure working with Mr. Price. I always felt safe up here. It's nice to have a commissioner <clears throat> who was involved with the law enforcement, but uh, both Barry Fisher and Joel Price will be missed. And I do know that the period is still open until I believe the 15th uh, to submit an application for the replacement of uh, Barry Fisher's seat. And then after Mr. Chappell, uh, Mr. <coughs> Chappell, Mr. Price is uh, sworn in, then it will open for his seat. Mr. Town, did you want to say? Just to note uh, that the application period for the current vacancy uh, due to Barry uh, Fisher's resignation has been extended to the 29th. So there's another two weeks. It was the 15th and just was just extended. Oh, okay. Thank you. And with that, if there aren't any other comments, I'll adjourn the meeting to March 26, 2012, 6.30 p.m. in this uh, room, and have a good evening.